All right, everyone. Uh, good evening once again. Uh, thanks again for joining us this evening um, for our Hurricanes 101, uh, the inaugural edition. Uh, we're hoping to make this a uh, an annual event, um, but this is the first time we're trying this, so hopefully no glitches, but um, we'll see what happens, and, and hopefully you can bear with us here as we uh, talk about hurricanes. Uh, obviously, we are into May. We are uh, about a month away or less now from hurricane season and uh, official start of it anyway. And so we wanted to take an opportunity to talk about hurricanes, but not only hurricanes, but all types of tropical systems. Um, I'm sure there's several of you who uh, already, you know, from the area, um, but also several of you who uh, maybe have just moved to the area and are not familiar with these types of storms. And so, yes, we've had our a good, sh you know, share of storms over the past several years. Um, but, you know, we wanted to take the opportunity now um, to talk a little bit about these storms and uh, the background on the storms, some hurricane basics, uh, the hazards they uh, they bring, how you can uh, stay safe and stay prepared and uh, stay informed. So um, with that, we will go ahead and get started. Um, we have uh, some, I have some help uh, tonight. Joining me is uh, Emily McGraw. Here we go. Uh, so there's me on the left. Uh, I've been with the weather service here in Charleston um, for about 18 years now. So I've been through my share of storms, especially in the last several years. Um, and on the right, you see Emily, um, and she loves releasing weather balloons. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about weather balloons as we go and, and how we observe some of these storms and, and make the hurricane forecast. Um, a few things I just wanted to run down as far as logistics for tonight. Um, Everybody is going to be placed in listen only mode. Um, so uh, we're asking everyone to uh, hold on if they have a question um, to you can enter it down in the uh, chat box. You should see a chat box um, through the go to so, uh, webinar software. Um, and we hope to get to some questions toward the end of the presentation. Um, there you go. So what I just said. And um, as we go throughout the, the presentation, there'll be some, some poll questions that'll pop up. Um, they should just pop up on your screen and you can answer those. And then we'll talk about, we'll show the results and talk about those. Um, and then after the webinar is over uh, and everything shuts down, uh, there'll be an opportunity to provide your feedback. And we would really appreciate that. Like I said, we're trying this uh, essentially for the first time now. And uh, so we'll see how it goes, hopefully well. But any feedback that you may have on, on the content or the present presentation, um, please provide your feedback, whether it's positive or negative. We would appreciate that. And we are recording this and we hope to, as long as everything goes smoothly, we hope to post that on our YouTube channel uh, as soon as we can. So with that, um, yeah, and so of course we would love for everybody to share uh, that as long as we get that posted, um, share that with your uh, friends and family. So the first, uh, we'll start off with a poll question here. Our first poll question of the night um, will be, where are you joining us from? So we're going to have Emily hop on here and help me out with uh, the first poll question. You can see the selections there. Yep, so everyone should be able to see our poll question on the screen now. Um, so where are you joining us from tonight? You got coastal South Carolina, coastal Georgia, 
inland South Carolina, inland Georgia, or elsewhere. So um, we'll talk about a little bit about what our office covers here shortly. But um, yeah, so tell us where you're joining us from. I'll give everyone another 30 seconds or maybe a little less. See some responses coming in. All right, so it looks like we've got the majority of people that has um, responded. So I'm going to close this and then I'm going to share the results of the poll. All right, yeah, so it looks like everyone um, should be able to see the results of the poll right now. Um, so it looks like the majority of um, our users right now are joining us from coastal South Carolina. So um, this is very relevant to you guys. And then uh, next um, down is elsewhere. So um, and we have some coastal Georgia, inland South Carolina. So we got a, a good little spread here. I'm going to hide this. All right, and then you can go ahead, Bob. All right. Thanks, Emily. And uh, appreciate everybody participating in that. Hopefully it wasn't too difficult. Uh, looks like most of you all from coastal South Carolina. Um, we were hoping to get some people from inland areas. It looks like we got a few, so that's good. Obviously, hurricanes and tropical systems don't just affect the coast. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go here. Um, so let's get on with the next slide. And so here's a general outline of uh, the, the topics. I, I mentioned a few already. Um, we're going to start off with an overview of, uh, you know, who we are and, and what we do um, here in, at the Weather Service office in Charleston. Emily will cover that. And then we'll get into the bulk of the presentation, which is, uh, you know, a little bit about tropical cyclone basics and background, um, the hazards, preparedness and safety, a little bit of history, and then how you can stay informed. So a little bit of everything tonight, hopefully um, it'll be interesting and hopefully you'll learn something. So with that, we'll, uh, we'll pass it over to Emily and she'll talk about um, our office and what we do and our mission um, to start off. All right, awesome, thanks Bob. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us tonight. So for those unfamiliar, I'm guessing most of you have somewhat of an idea of what the National Weather Service does. Um, but first, I'm going to hit our, home our mission. Um, so our mission is essentially providing weather, hydrologic, and climate forecasts and warnings for the United States, its, its territories, and adjacent waters. And here's the big part for the protection of life and property. Um, so if you ever see those severe thunderstorm warnings or tornado warnings, those coming up on your you know, your television screen, we're the ones that issue those. So um, we're a federal agency, we're a line office under NOAA. Um, so we're there essentially um, for the protection of life and property to issue those warnings and forecasts. All right, so look at our National Weather Service organization. So all those tiny red dots across the screen, across the screen um, those are weather forecast offices. So where me and Bob are from, the National Weather Service in Charleston, South Carolina, so that's the local office. We'll talk about in a second about um, the areas that we cover. Um, but so they're spread out across the country. We all have designated forecast and warning areas that we're responsible for. And then we also have some specialized centers. So um, the big one tonight that we're going to be talking about is the National Hurricane Center, and they're a center down in Miami, Florida. Um, but then we also have other specialized centers, such as the Storm Prediction Center um, out in Oklahoma. We have a Space Weather Prediction Center. So um, the National Weather Service encompasses just more than um, the weather. All right, and so here's a look at um, our office's area of, of responsibility. So we cover 20 counties across Southeast South Carolina and Southeast Georgia. Um, so from the South Fancy River in South Carolina, that's our Northern extent, and then to the South, the Altamaha River down in Georgia. Um, so that star that you see in the screen, that is actually where our office is located. So we're right next to the um, air traffic control tower at the Charleston International Airport. So if you ever are flying out of that airport and you look out the window, there's a little building, you see a little dome, that's where um, we launch our weather balloons from. So we're right um, in the Charleston area. Um, that picture of that you see down in Jasper County in, our, in the central part of our area, that is where our radar is located. Um, so, it, you know, we have to have it centered in our area so we can get a widespread and um, be able to look at everything that's going on within our area. So we also have some neighbors to our north. Um, that's the Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, they cover to the north of us. We have Columbia across the inland South Carolina. 
um, Peachtree City, that is Atlanta, and they cover up to our um, western areas, and then to our south is Jacksonville, Florida, um, weather forecast office. So some of our big population centers, obviously we have Charleston, um, Savannah down in Georgia is another big one. We have Statesboro in Georgia, we have um, Walterboro. So we have um, some a decent population centers, and right now our population is over one and a half million. So one thing you may not know or may not realize is that we are open 24-7, 365. So that means holidays at 2 a.m. on a Friday or Sunday morning. Um, we're here all the time. Um, we have 20 employees, so that includes um, operational meteorologists that do rotating shift work. And then we also have support staff, such as electronics technicians that maintain our equipment. Um, and then we have some administrative support assistant. And then we also have some management that also, there are, are also meteorologists, so they're, um, they can fill in on the forecast desk as well. So working 24-7, 365, that means that during the hurricanes, when people are issuing, you know, you're getting your evacuation orders, most of the time that we have to stay at the office to um, provide those warnings and forecasts um, for the tropical system to help people prepare for what's coming. So our building is designed to withstand storms. So there are times during the worst of it when we have people staying at the office, sleeping on cots and things of that sort. So um, it's an all hands on deck situation during these tropical events. Um, so our, our office responsibilities, I'm not going to go through all of these because there's a lot of different aspects. Obviously, as I mentioned in our mission, our highest priority is um, protection of life and property. So that includes the severe weather watches and warnings and advisories. Um, so that encompasses with the tropical weather as well since we issue those. Um, so we do seven day public forecasts um, and marine forecasts. We also have aviation. We have a couple airports that we're forecasting for. So there's a lot of different stuff other than just the weather that we're working on too. So we do research, we do outreach talks such as this or school talks. Um, and we work a lot with our partners such as emergency managers and media um, to help make sure that the proper messaging and the wording gets out when severe weather or tropical weather is coming. So you can see all the other things, like I said, I'm not gonna touch on all of them, but um, obviously our biggest mission is protection of life and property. And so that's where we will be issuing those severe watches and warnings. And, in this case, tropical weather. All right, so with that, I think we have our next poll question. So have you ever experienced a tropical storm or hurricane? So let me pull that up. I'm gonna launch it. It's just a yes, no question. Um, so you should be able to see on your screen, have you experienced a tropical storm or hurricane? So please select one. Give everyone a few seconds. All right, still seeing some votes coming in. All right, so it looks like we got a vast majority, so I'm going to go ahead and close this poll. Let me share the results here. All right, so it looks like most of you guys have experienced a tropical storm and hurricane or hurricane at one um, point in your life, um, whether it be recent or in distant past. I know Hugo is a big one that everyone you know, refers back to, especially in the Charleston area. So um, yeah, so it looks like the vast majority of you have experienced one, but I'm glad to see that there are some um, people that have not experienced some. So hopefully you guys will all learn something here tonight. So let me hide the poll. All right, and then Bob, I think you can go ahead. All right, looks like, can you see me and hear me again? Yep. All right, so uh, looks like, so as Emily said, you know, most of you have experienced a, a tropical cyclone of some sort. Uh, I bet you if we polled even further and asked, you know, what what kinds of impacts you you saw and, and how each storm uh, may or may not have been different, we'd probably get a, a wide variety of answers. So, uh, you know, one of the things that's quite interesting, especially from a forecast perspective, is how every storm is unique. And... Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. So uh, let's start off with some basics here. So uh, let's uh, let's start, you know, baking baking a pie maybe. And and what do you need to bake a pie, right? You need ingredients. So um, a few of the things that, you know, you need to get a tropical cyclone. Um, and essentially a tropical cyclone, if you're not familiar, is, is the terminology that we use to describe 
any type of cyclone or low pressure system um, uh, that that has tropical, uh, you know, has tropical characteristics. And we'll talk a little bit about the types of tropical cyclones here in a minute. But essentially, you need some type of low pressure system, some type of disturbance to kind of uh, it's like a little seed to start the storm. Um, and you also need some other conditions like very warm water. And of course, uh, you know, that's why we typically don't get tropical cyclones uh, in the wintertime um, because the, the waters are cooler, especially around here. So um, other, other than that, you also need some warm, humid air because that, that means the air is unstable. It wants to rise, create those thunderstorms, which we need to develop the tropical cyclone. And then in the atmosphere, um, you know, you might have different uh, thunderstorms all, all around, but if they're not organized together, then you really have, will have a hard time getting uh, a tropical cyclone to develop. So essentially what you need is weak vertical wind shear. So winds in the atmosphere um, as you go up in height, and uh, we're talking about many miles up, um, you know, going in different directions at different speeds, that's called wind shear. So that's not very conducive to thunderstorm uh, develop, uh, especially organization, um, and for particularly for tropical cyclone uh, development. So uh, again, those are the ingredients. Uh, you need to have those um, to even have a chance of getting a, a tropical cyclone. So once we, once we get a disturbance and it looks like it's starting to maybe organize with some thunderstorms um, kind of around a, a central point, uh, we get a, a tropical depression. And this is pretty much the least organized stage. Um, but at this point, we're talking about winds less than, you know, 39 miles an hour. So less than 40 miles an hour, uh, peak winds, sustained winds. Um, and that is the tropical depression stage. Now, if we get a little bit more organization to the system um, and the winds start to increase uh, up to 73 miles an hour, um, now we have a tropical storm. And at this stage is uh, where when the system gets a name from the Hurricane Center. And then if it continues to develop and the winds be, uh, become even stronger, and we're talking about 74 miles an hour or greater sustained winds. Um, and we're talking about organized thunderstorms around a central point. Um, this is when we, when we have a hurricane. And then we can categorize the, those hurricanes on a scale of one to five. It's called the Saffir Simpson scale. And we're talking about winds starting anywhere from 74 miles an hour at the low end of a Cat 1 all the way up to 157 miles an hour or greater, which is a Category 5. And it's really those major hurricanes, a Category 3, 4, and 5, that really, um, you know, pr produce most, most of the damage. Now, it's, certain, it's not to say that Category 1s and 2s are irrelevant and we shouldn't be concerned about them because obviously wind is just one aspect of the storm. So um, we really need to be you know, look at the holistic picture uh, when it comes to these storms and even de tropical depressions, tropical storms can certainly cause significant impacts, especially uh, with rainfall and maybe tornadoes. Um, so it doesn't just have to be the wind. And I know everybody thinks wind when they hear hurricane. Um, but one of the things, if, if you remember anything from tonight is it's not just about the wind. So, um, and oftentimes it's more about the flooding and we'll talk a little bit about that. So um, here's essentially a, a little picture um, diagram of, of what the parts of the hurricane uh, are. And um, the eye of the hurricane is, is, is the center. And that's where you essentially have the storms rotating around that center, but right in that center, there are no thunderstorms and maybe there aren't even any clouds. There's hardly any wind or rain. It's amazing um, how you can get uh, winds over 150 miles an hour um, just outside of that area, um, which 
we call the eye wall. So that's essentially um, where the strongest uh, thunderstorms are. That's typically uh, right around the eye um, in that eye wall. And that's typically where the strongest winds are uh, found. And then as you go away, farther away from the center, um, you find these rain bands and they can extend hundreds of miles you know, out. And that's why, again, these storms aren't just a point on a map. They're, they're broad and expansive and, and have impacts that can extend well away from the center. Um, so yeah, you can have strong winds, heavy rain, uh, tornadoes, um, all, you know, in those rain bands as well. All right, next uh, poll question. Um, so before we get into uh, the times of the year where we see, you know, typically tropical cyclones, especially across Southeast uh, South Carolina, Southeast Georgia, we wanted to see what you guys think, which, which month do we see the most tropical cyclone activity in the local area? So Emily, you can start yep. open it up and all right here we go so as bob was saying let's see what, what you guys think which month do we see the most tropical cyclone activity across southeast south carolina and georgia so your options are july august september or october all right so i'm starting to see some responses come in we'll give it all another few 10 seconds or so All right, so we have an overwhelming majority. So let me close this poll and let me share the results and see what you guys got. Yeah, so it looks like our overwhelmingly um, response is for September being the peak month where we see the most tropical cyclone activity across Southeast South Carolina and Georgia. So what do you think, Bob, how'd they do? All right, let's find out here. Um, I think they did pretty well. So here we go. So this is when we talk about our tropical season, uh, of course, we're we're talking about the Atlantic Basin. So that essentially includes uh, the northern Atlantic Ocean, uh, the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea. Um, so the official Atlantic hurricane season runs from June 1st all the way through November. And you can see, uh, based on this chart we have here, um, we did a little bit of research recently and looked at storms that, you know, came within a certain distance of our area. Um, yeah, you can see most of the storms um, were in September. So good job to those who answered September. But October, that's a busy time too. Uh, 69, that's actually the second, uh, second most. And then we have August. And then we also have June and July uh, on there coming in um, with about the same amount. We also have some in May. And we actually even have uh, some in November. And we also had a tropical storm way back in February 1952 that really didn't affect the area it was just uh, mainly offshore but you can see um, you know really when we get into May we start to see activity uh, increase but it really ramps up uh, by the time we get to August and then by the time we get to September and then October um, we do start to see a decrease but certainly we can see some impactful storms and then even some in November. So again, like I said, storms can occur outside the, the normal time, but the peak really is that August um, through October and especially September and, uh, and October as well. So yeah, good job to everyone. You can see obviously some of the, if you're familiar with the local history, you can see you know, some of our biggest storms, at least strongest storms, uh, typically occur later in the, in the season. Um, like Hugo in 1989, we had Gracie 1959. Uh, we had a Category 3 
1893 in October. Uh, there was a great Sea Island storm uh, in, that occurred actually in August of 1893 as well. That was a pretty rough year with a couple major hurricanes impacting the area. Um, and then, you know, July, typically these storms are weaker. Uh, there was a Category 2 in 1916. Um, but even some of these other storms, I, I believe Alberto, Bonnie, um, pretty impactful storms and they weren't, you know, they weren't hurricanes. So, um, again, that's something to really keep in mind is, uh, we don't have to actually see a hurricane to have significant impacts. So here is a little bit more about our history. We just look back, uh, at our records. Um, 1851 is when the official records began. So looking uh, through last season, um, and we actually saw 42 tropical cyclones making landfall in our forecast area. And that runs from Charleston County in South Carolina, south to, through uh, McIntosh County in Georgia. And if you break those down, you see that seven were tropical depressions, 10 were tropical storms. We had 25 hurricanes. And uh, of those hurricanes, five were major hurricanes. So probably none of us were here for September 1854. Uh, we didn't have names back then. Um, I mentioned the Great Sea Island storm. That was in August of 1893. Probably weren't here for that one either. Uh, we also had one in uh, that other one in uh, 1893 in October. Um, and then we had Gracie in 59. Some of you may have been around for that one. That one uh, made landfall down near Beaufort. And then, of course, Hugo, which is really the, the last time we've seen a major hurricane landfall here. So it has certainly been a while, over 30 years now. And so we're, you know, we're just waiting for the next one. We know it's coming at some point. Um, so the next poll question is, uh, which hazard from tropical cyclones do you think is the most deadly so we talked about a little bit about where and when these form um, now we're going to start getting into the hazards and um, so the question is which of the hazards do you think uh, is the most deadly so with that emily will open up that poll and we'll see what you guys say yep so here's your next poll question like Bob said, which hazard from tropical cyclones do you think is the most deadly? So we have storm surge as an option, flooding rain, high winds, or tornadoes. So we'll give it, seeing about 60% is voted so far, so we'll, I'll wait another 10 seconds or so. All right, so it looks like the majority has voted. Let me close the poll. Oh, make another couple trickling in. So we're seeing a little bit more of a spread here. So let me close the poll and share it. And so you guys should be able to see the poll results now. So it looks like the majority um, says storm surge is the most deadly hazard from tropical cyclones and can't. Flooding rain and high winds was a close second. Um, those are um, almost nearly tied. And then um, tornadoes is what everyone thinks is the um, not as likely to be the most deadly. So, um, Bob, what you think? Let me hide the poll. And then go ahead, Bob. All right. So we are back. Uh, looks, I think you all did pretty well um, on that one. Um, Certainly water uh, is a theme here that we will be talking about. Let's see if I can, there we go. So uh, yeah, so as far as the the hazards are concerned, I mean, there's multi multiple different hazards. Um, like we asked in the poll, we have storm surge. Um, you know, that's just all the ocean water that the storm pushes on onto land. Uh, we have, of course, the high winds, um, you know, obviously the stronger storms are going to have stronger winds. Um, and typically the stronger storms have uh, the higher storm surge, but there are nuances here. And um, 
you know, with every storm, it's a little bit different. Um, also, we got rip currents. Um, those can be certainly uh, deadly if you're if you're in the water. And, you know, a lot of times um, it's unfortunate, but even tropical cyclones, uh, hurricanes that pass well offshore uh, that really don't bring us any significant direct impact, there still could be um, really strong rip currents. And so unfortunately people, that's one of the uh, things that does cause quite a few fatalities, unfortunately. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, even, even though um, we might not be getting directly impacted. We also have tornadoes and, and water spouts, which is just a tornado over the water. Um, those are impactful. And then we also have the, the flooding rain. So really the main um, message here is that when you think hurricane or, you know, even tropical cyclone, it could be a depression, storm, um, think flooding. Flooding is actually um, what causes the most deaths. And um, it's from, you know, if we talk about storm surge flooding, as well as flooding rain, um, that's flooding. And that's what um, we really want to reiterate to everyone is it's really the water, not necessarily the wind that that is, um, you know, causing, causing the most uh, fatality. So, you know, just keep that in mind. Um, you know, water, water um, over wind. So with that, we're going to talk uh, about the different hazards and we're going to start off with with the flooding aspect like we talked about. So, you know, flooding from heavy rain as well as from the storm surge, you know, like I mentioned, causes most of the death. And you can see uh, the two pictures we have there. One is from uh, Folly Beach after Hurricane Hugo in 1989, and that was from the intense storm surge there. Um, and to be honest, it wasn't even the worst uh, of the storm surge because that actually impacted areas um, just up the coast toward McClellanville, where they really saw the worst of it. Um, you know, about a 20 foot storm surge up that way. Um, if that had actually come and affected uh, areas south of Charleston um, or in Charleston itself in downtown, really, we would have had a, a, a much worse scenario than it, than it already was. So that was one saving grace from Hugo um, that the storm made landfall just north of Charleston. Um, also, uh, Tropical Storm Bonnie, you can see the bottom right, and um, that actually is... Um, Interstate 95, you can't even tell that, um, you know, several inches of rain fell uh, from Tropical Storm Bonnie. That was in 2016. Um, and you can see those cars submerged and really uh, there's no roadway that could be seen. So it's really critical that you know if you live in an area prone to flooding. Um, and again, it does not have to be at the immediate coast. So, you know, you can live several miles inland, especially if you're uh, along a waterway, uh, a creek, um, any, anything that's connected to the ocean, that water, you know, that ocean water can push many miles inland uh, with the right storm. So um, especially if you live, you know, of course, we're the low country, right? Uh, most of the area is very low lying. So that's how, you know, essentially got its name. So you can get um water that travels well inland um just due to the low-lying nature uh elevation of, of the area so that's really important that you know if you're in a flood zone excuse me and especially if you're in an evacuation uh zone and those typically are set up based on the areas that are uh, most prone to flooding but it's it's not just uh the storm surge flooding but it's also flooding, like I mentioned, from uh, for inland areas as, as well from the rainfall. Um, so you have to really keep that in mind um, as well. A lot of you, you know, may live along the rivers and you might think, yeah, I'm fine. I'm, you know, 30 miles inland. Well, you know, if we get a storm that dumps 
20, 30 plus inches of rain, you know, we're going to have some issues. Um, you know, back in 2015, we essentially saw quite a bit of flooding um, from, uh, it was, we had hur uh, Hurricane, I think, Joaquin offshore, combination of, of um, you know, 20 plus inches of rain across a wide area. Um, you know, there was a lot of high tides. There was a lot going on. Uh, we saw a lot of flooding across the area. So, again, we don't need a landfalling storm. Uh, we don't need a Category 5. Um, we can see significant flooding from weaker storms as well. So the guidance really is, you know, listen to the local officials uh, regarding evacuation. Um, they're really the ones that, um, you know, make those decisions um, to, 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 you know, try to keep everybody safe based on the latest forecast. Also keep in mind, I mean, water is, is heavy. I'm sure you know this. Uh, if you've been around water, uh, you know, it, it, you know, grab a bucket fill it with water. It's, it's, it's heavy, right? Um, so it has a lot of force. And if you have, um, you know, a hundred plus mile an hour winds pushing that water, for an extended period, uh, it's gonna have a lot of force. So um, obviously if you live right at the beach, you're gonna have uh, the flooding um, from the storm surge. You're gonna have waves on top of that from the strong winds. Um, that's really what causes a lot of the damage right at the coast um, from these storms, especially the bigger, the bigger hurricanes. And like we say all year, turn around, don't drown. We don't want people being caught in a flood. We don't want them thinking, oh, I can drive through this. I got a big, big, uh, big rig. I, you know, I can get through this. Um, it only takes about a foot or so of water to, to move a vehicle, um, you know, especially a smaller vehicle. So um, if you can't see the road, uh, you know, we highly encourage you not to drive, try to drive through it, um, especially because, you know, that road might be washed out. You don't know what's underneath. So, um, you know, and again, you know, this map is essentially showing areas that are very, you know, that are vulnerable to the storm surge. So you can see quite a bit of the area is vulnerable to storm surge, uh, especially as you head inland up those uh, creeks and rivers and and such so a lot of the area is vulnerable um and really that's that's the main point to drive home and this map just you know shows the vulnerability to storm surge and that doesn't you know we're not even talking about you know you got heavy rain on top of that and and other things going on you might have you know what if the ground is already wet, wet from other storms that we've had, you know, right before the, the storm or, uh, you know, obviously the wet ground that can't hold as much moisture. So that's going to lead, you know, potentially to, to more flooding. So there's a lot of factors that are considered, um, you know, when we're talking about the impacts. Um, so again, storm surge and flooding rain um, really are, are what causes you know, the most deaths, unfortunately. Um, historically, it's storm surge, um, but a lot of that has to do with storms um, from a long time ago when we didn't have the, the forecasting capability and the evacuation um, system in place. And so a lot of those storms, um, like I talked about in the uh, local storms from like the 1800s, um, you know, the Sea Island storm caused, you know, approximately over 2,000 deaths. Uh, the, the Great Galveston Hurricane, 1900, in, in, in uh, Galveston, Texas. So those really drove up the numbers. Um, with, you know, over, over more recently, because we have gotten a better handle on evacuations and moving people away from the coast, uh, fortunately, the storm surge deaths have really diminished. We have better watches and warnings now. So the focus really, as far as deaths go, is really trans transferred inland to the heavy rain and people just, again, not taking that, that threat seriously. Um, now, when it comes to the storm surge, just to note that, you know, we're, we're forecasting essentially 
when you hear numbers of, of storm surge forecast from, from us, uh, from the Hurricane Center, we're really talking about inundation, and that's essentially the depth of the water above the ground. So, you know, our modeling capabilities are, are good enough now. We can, we understand where uh, the land is and how, you know, what the elevations of, of the land is, are. And so we can incorporate that into our, our storm surge modeling and try to tell people, um, you know, graphically where, the, you know, what areas might be more at risk from the storm surge inundation. And that's, again, that's the water um, above the ground level. So, all right, so we'll continue on here. And, and we did, you know, we definitely wanted to mention the strong winds um, as well. Uh, of course, the flooding being most important really, but of course, strong winds can have significant impacts. Um, you can see that top image is uh, Sullivan's Island. That's the Ben Sawyer bridge that was turned uh, turned around from the winds from Hurricane Hugo. Hurricane Hugo actually made landfall right at Sullivan's Island there. Um, but, you know, Hugo was interesting just because it was such a strong storm. It was Category 4 at landfall, but it, it even was still a Category 1 hurricane all the way up to Charlotte, North Carolina, which was quite amazing. And there was extensive wind damage with that storm because it was so strong at the coast and um, it was moving pretty quick. So it really was able to transfer and bring all that wind energy well inland. So again, you know, we can't write off the winds. Um, you know, I think this was a radio tower somewhere up um, towards Charlotte. Um, area in that bottom picture. Um, so of course, the main thing is, you know, know, you know, if you're going to shelter inland somewhere, still be aware, um, you know, hundreds of miles from the coast that you still can have strong damaging winds. So you need to be alert if you have trees near your house, if you live, you know, especially in a mobile home, which are more vulnerable to the wind. Um, you really got to think about these issues as well. Um, it's best to use plywood or shutters um, for, you know, boarding up. And um, also like garage doors are typically a weak uh, point. And, you know, if the garage door blows in, uh, that wind can and pressure can can do damage uh, more so um, to the rest of the structure. So that's also um, a point to uh, consider as well about your garage door. And I know down here near the coast, um, you know, we, a lot of, especially the newer homes have reinforced garage doors just for that reason. Now, during a storm, um, you'd want to go to your interior room on the, on the lowest level, uh, of course, but you don't want to, you got, you have to be concerned if you're, if your area is prone to flooding. So you don't want to, uh, shelter in an interior room on the low lowest floor of your house or uh you know wherever you're at and then also have to deal with flooding that might occur so you have to you also have to keep in mind um you know that the flooding aspect as well and of course be prepared for you know power outages for for a while i know after after hugo uh it took several weeks for folks to get power back so Obviously, that that was a huge impact, and uh, you know, especially nowadays, we're we're so accustomed to having power uh, at our fingertips. So obviously, that that would be a big big deal, um, more so than in 1989 for sure. So how do we how do we forecast these storms? Well, uh, like Emily mentioned in the beginning, it really starts at the National Hurricane Center, uh, and they're in down in Miami, Florida, and you. Their website is there, hurricanes.gov for short. Um, they really issue the big picture forecast of you know the storm track and in intensity and those coastal uh, tropical storm or hurricane watches and warnings as well as storm surge watches and warnings. So um, you know they're they're there watching the tropics all year all year long. Um, of course, you know a lot of the year they're they're not. Uh, as busy in terms of actually forecasting for storms. Um, 
but you know, certainly they're doing a lot of other things like research and improving our products and services for the following year, doing research and reports and that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, but the local weather service offices, uh, like ours in Charleston, we take, we coordinate with the hurricane center and take that information and we tailor it down to the local area. So for Southeast South Carolina, Southeast Georgia, um, we're responsible for, um, for doing that for this, uh, this area. And so we'll, we'll take the, the big picture forecast, um, the watches and warnings at the coast, and we'll expand those as we need to for inland areas, as we, as we, you know, based on the threat and as, as, as needed for that particular, uh, storm. And then the weather service as a whole, we're doing a whole lot of different coordination and it really, it's pretty much all hands on deck and we really rely on our partners like the emergency management community, um, the media, you know, they really help us um, get our message out and, um, you know, help people prepare you know, so they can stay safe. And of course, you know, like Emily mentioned, our biggest uh, mission is to save lives and property. So there's a whole lot of coordination uh, going on at the local level, state, federal levels. Um, you know, it's especially when you're dealing with evacuations and that kind of thing, it really uh, becomes, you know, a logistical uh, challenge to coordinate all of that and um you know again it all really boils down to that hurricane center forecast and um you know that's essentially how how we do it um when it comes to the forecasting as well um you know what kind of tools we have you know we start off with aircraft um those hurricane hunters from noaa as well as the air force uh, those are the hurricane hunter planes that fly into the storms. Uh, we got radar uh, data uh, over, you know, the land-based radar data that we can use to observe the storms. Of course, satellite is really a huge thing over over the ocean because uh, we don't have as much observations out there. Um, we do have some ship and buoy uh, observations. Um, but really we rely heavily on those satellite observations and of course the aircraft to fly into the storms um, over the ocean as well. So we can get the best data, uh, best observations into our computer models to make the forecast. Um, we also um, release weather balloons. Now not every weather service office does that. Um, we, we do that here in Charleston. Um, Emily loves releasing those balloons, um, but we all do that. Um, and we, we release those twice a day, actually all throughout the year, but during a hurricane event or tropical cyclone event, um, as needed, we'll, we'll issue or release those balloons, um, and collect data, you know, sometimes up to four times a day. So every six hours. So, you know, certainly gets quite busy if, if we're dealing with that as well. And then, you know, all of that, information uh, goes into computer models. So these computer models make a forecast, uh, you know, out into the future and there's all different kinds of models and, and we won't really get into all the details, but some are, you know, designed, they're all designed a little bit differently. Um, but, you know, when it comes down to it, it's really the models as well as our, uh, the forecasters experience. So the hurricane center has a lot of experience. Um, you know, they, a lot of them have been doing this for a long time, you know, and just like normal forecasts, like we do on a daily basis, you know, it really takes some time to get used to the weather patterns and, and get familiar with, you know, how things evolve typically in certain areas. So, um, you know, we really, again, it's, it's a, it's it's a lot of people on deck, a lot of equipment, a lot of tools that go into making these forecasts. So, a little bit about the some of the products that you may see out there uh, on the internet from the Hurricane Center. Um, oops. So the 
the tropical weather outlook this essentially they'll do an outlook for a, uh, for the next two days as well as the next five days so you can see you know where the storms are at currently if there's any disturbances that you know they're watching that might have a chance of development they'll they'll uh you know include those in in the outlook as well and then once there's an actual storm then you know they produce the forecast and the forecast uh has a has an error cone and the important thing to keep in mind about about that error cone is that it's just a uh, a likely track of the center of the storm so it's it's not an impact area or anything like that um so you really have to be careful when you're when you're you know looking at that from a uh you know what can i expect perspective um it's not whether you're in the cone or outside the cone um that's just where the storm may track the center of the storm but like i mentioned every storm is different some are big some are small some are stronger some are weaker some have heavy rain uh some have more tornadoes so uh, don't focus on that cone i know a lot of people um, like to do that so that's one one thing that we just want to reiterate is to uh you know that it's not an area of impact and then there's other products like wind speed probabilities so the chance of tropical storm force winds um you know and you can get different products as well chance of hurricane force winds uh as well and then those are kind of the main hurricane center products but then when you get down to that local level um you know we have a, a neat tool um the hurricane threat and impacts graphics um, is a really nice suite of products graphics for uh, showing the potential impacts from the four main uh, hazards being wind storm surge the rain and the tornado so um these the these graphics you know essentially incorporate all that information the forecast and um you know what the probabilities are for certain hazards and 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 you know our experience and all that we all that is baked into these graphics to essentially tell people uh what the different threat levels are for the different hazards um and then with those different threat levels it's a different you know our associated impact potential impacts so you know for this example we're looking at potential in that purple area potential for wind greater than 110 miles an hour that's associated with a, a typical certain impact um and that type of information is what we we try to relay um to to everybody um in our in our briefings and our different products like the hurricane local statement that's one product that's a kind of the big picture overview for the hazards over the land area across the area um and then we also got a local um tropical watch warning statement and that is really a county-based um product so it provides more detail you know on that county level and some of our partners and customers they they need that type of information so um you know that's another product that we issue and then when the storm is over we also issue a post-storm report so we collect data uh and observations of you know what were the strongest winds the heaviest rain and what the impacts were and you know we have to go after the storm we have to go do damage surveys and and collect a lot of information and then we try to you know put that summarize that in a um in a report called the post-storm uh report so you know there's a lot a lot of products and this really touches on this kind of just the the beginnings of um of the products and services that we provide but at least it's a good overview uh of the things that we do now as far as staying informed hopefully you're aware of our website uh it's weather.gov forward slash chs the mobile version uh is there as well and you know if you go on the website and click on a point uh for your location and then up pops you know the current conditions and the forecast well you can get the forecast in a variety of formats you can get an hourly forecast uh you can get all kinds of information hopefully you're already aware of that but if you're not um, i highly encourage you to take a look 
and look at that. Um, now, beyond the main page, which is just the weather.gov uh, slash CHS page, we have a local tropical page. And that's where you'll find pretty much all the tropical information um, you know, that we talked about earlier and even more information will be on that tropical page. So it's just weather.gov slash CHS slash tropical. We also have a briefing page and that is uh, slash briefing. Um, and that has a lot of information as well. So if you're, you know, it's kind of broken up by the types of hazard, uh, you know, precipitation or there is a little travel section on there as well. Um, so you can get, you know, severe weather. Um, that page is, is used quite a bit throughout the season, um, but it's a good resource as well to try to get caught up on the latest uh, briefing, if, you know, big picture, one-stop shop uh, for a lot of the different products that we have. And then again, the Hurricane Center, um, you can go directly to them as well. And that's uh, the short, URL for that is hurricanes.gov. Now, of course, you can also find us on social media, uh, Facebook and Twitter, uh, at NWS Charleston SC. Uh, mobile devices, um, you know, most people have those now. And um, you may already be familiar with the wireless emergency alerts um, for certain types of warnings that we issue. Um, so in a tropical situation, um, you'll see some different, uh, alerts. I believe you'll, you'll get the hurricane warning. And I think also the storm surge warning, depending on where you're, you know, what area you're in, if you're in that warning area or, or close by. And then, um, we still got no weather radio that's been around a long time. Um, but you know, that could be real critical especially because you can run that on battery um, if the power goes out. So that's another source uh, of, you know, information that you can access, you know, our forecast, our watches and warnings that broadcast continuously. And, you know, again, those, those are useful, especially if the power goes out and you have, um, you know, you still have to, you, you want to access information. So, um, as far as preparedness, um, this, uh, upcoming week, uh, May 9th to the 15th is actually uh, hurricane preparedness week. Um, so we wanted to give this presentation, get people, you know, back thinking about, uh, you know, it's hurricane season coming up. How, you know, what can I do? What kind of steps can I take now um, because you certainly don't want to wait to the last minute um, to you know dust off your plans your disaster plans get those supplies um, you'll be hearing more about this as we as we go you know over the next several weeks but officially May 9th to 15th next week is is uh, national hurricane preparedness week you'll you'll be seeing us put out you know more information especially through social media um, so I highly encourage you to take a look at that. Um, we also have a hurricane guide, a pretty comprehensive guide that covers a lot of different aspects. Um, you can access it at this link or uh, it's also at the top of our tropical page. Um, but that's a pretty comprehensive guide. It pretty much covers um, a lot of what we're talking about tonight, preparedness, safety. Um, it has a lot of different links of information um, where you can find um, all of that and really a big resource is the county and state emergency management offices so you may or may not be aware um, that each county as well as each state has uh, emergency management uh, office and so um, in south carolina as well as georgia so um, if you have questions about your vulnerabilities to certain hazards like flooding um, highly encourage you you know you can course start with the hurricane guide here um, or go directly to your county or, or state emergency management uh, agency office and they can certainly um, help you out so a few takeaways uh, from tonight is really uh, 
you know, re just remember, you know, every storm is unique. Um, like I mentioned at the open, you know, even if you've lived here a number of years, uh, you've been through several storms, um, you probably say that every storm is different in, in some, some uh, shape or form. So that's the main thing, uh, you know, one of the main things that we want you to, to take away from tonight. Also, do not focus just on the intensity of the storm. I know people get hyped up about, you know, oh, it's a Cat 1 or a Cat 2, Cat 3, et cetera. Really, it's more than that. Um, we really want people to focus on the impact, uh, potential impacts. And so, obviously, we're, you know, we're looking at that um, all the time, and that's what we're trying to to forecast and relay uh, that information about what those potential impacts are um, and what you should be preparing for. Uh, you know, flooding, again, water um, is the number one killer. Uh, obviously, a combination of rainfall, flooding, and storm surge, especially combined, um, really produces the most death. So um, whether you're a prone to storm surge, or far enough away from water where, um, you know, at least from the coast that you wouldn't be affected by surge, you could still be affected by uh, flooding rain, uh, especially when you get more into those elevated areas. I know some of you said you weren't even from the local area. So if you're, if you're in a, uh, you know, y'all, a mountainous area, especially, um, you know, upstate, you know, definitely, something to be concerned about um, because flooding can happen a lot more quickly in, in areas that have a significant elevation. And then also a reminder, you know, get, rely on reputable sources. Um, you know, that includes us, um, local state officials, the local media, um, you know, they, they do their best to relay a lot of the information that we're putting out there. So, Certainly appreciate their efforts to help spread the word. And really, when it comes down to it, you know, we, we want to encourage everybody to prepare every every year, um, no matter what, you know, the seasonal forecast might be. You probably have heard already that, you know, some, some folks are thinking it's going to be another active season. But, you know, again, we just don't know exactly if, if it's our turn. So, um Take the time now while it's quieter um, to to look at your vulnerabilities, look at your local risks, and and do your best to you know to make those preparations. Um, it's really not the thing you want to be doing when a storm is bearing down uh, on the local area. So it only takes one. Um, we like to say that often, and so just remember that and. Um, you know, obviously last year being a very busy year, uh, very, very busy year. Um, but what impacts do we have? Pretty, pretty minimal impacts. Uh, you know, but you ask the folks down in Louisiana and I'm sure they would tell you that it was, it was a pretty rough year, um, for them. So we just never really know, especially months in advance, you know, exactly what areas are going to see the storms. Um, and again, it, it only takes one. So with that, um, we want to wish everybody a, a safe hurricane season. Uh, we want to remind everyone um, that we will try our best to post this presentation after on our YouTube page and hope that you can help share the, the message and the, and, the, and the word about safety and preparedness. Um, so with that, um, we appreciate you joining tonight. Um, there will be a feedback form that you'll see after um, we end the presentation. So hopefully uh, we would appreciate that feedback as well. And with that, we'll, we'll wrap it up and we'll see if there are any questions. Um, I think we have a little time. I know we're a little bit past eight o'clock, but certainly um, we can hang on for a little bit longer here and see if we do have any questions, um, Emily, is there anything that you've noticed that has come up? 
Yeah, so we did get a, a few questions. So as Bob said, we're a little after eight, so we'll only grab a couple um, right now and then we'll try to answer it um, maybe in a follow-up email, any questions that we don't get to, but we'll try to hit a couple right now before we wrap up. Um, so the first question came in pretty early. Um, so the user said, I'm looking to buy or build a house on either Kiowa or Seabrook Island. I recognize the worst storm surge scenarios for a hurricane to come on shore just south of the islands. What are the different storm surge scenarios that would be expected depending on the strength and track of the hurricane? So I know that's a little specific. So maybe Bob, you could point us in the direction of where um, people could find storm surge information and mapping. Okay. Um, if I caught the gist of it, um, you know, I guess you're looking at the vulnerability of that area. Um, and I'd recommend there are some links on, if you go to our tropical page, so that's again, weather.gov um, slash CHS slash tropical. Um, and I believe on one of the tabs there, there's a, a preparedness or uh, a, another tab for links maybe where you can safety information or, or preparedness. I, I, I don't remember offhand, um, but that has a, a lot of links you can find information um, on storm surge risk. Um, also the Hurricane Center, um, they have a storm surge section on their webpage. So if you go to hurricanes.gov, um, you can look up, um, they have, I, I showed one of the images from the storm surge risk map um, there. So you can look at, you know, different category hurricanes and kind of get an idea just based on the intensity of the storms. Um, you know, what the vulnerability might be for that particular area. But keep in mind, again, that, you know, it's really more than just based on the intensity of storm. So it's just that it gives you an idea of, um, you know, what kind of, um, you know, essentially just based on the wind speeds, what kind of storm surge uh, inundation you, you could see. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, if it doesn't, uh, feel free to reach out to us uh through email or phone or or social media and we'll be happy to to help you further yep and we can also try to include um some of those links um, maybe in a follow-up email as well all right so here was another question it was about tornadoes so it was how common is embedded tornadic activity in hurricanes and cyclones so yeah so tornadoes i mean uh, they're definitely uh you know, these types of tropical systems, tropical cyclones can definitely produce tornadoes. Some um, can produce more than others. Uh, it's not just based on the intensity of the storm, but um, other factors, you know, how it interacts with land, um, you know, sometimes depending on whether they occur at night or during the day. And again, you know, how much fuel there might be for, for these storms, but, Yes, yeah, certainly, um, you know, every storm is a little bit different. There's, there are different factors involved, um, but certainly these, these storms, and it doesn't even have to be, again, it doesn't have to be a strong hurricane. Uh, you can have depressions that produce tornadoes as well. And like I mentioned, the, you know, the, the one thing about tornadoes is that, yeah, they might not produce as many deaths and, and you might not think of those as, as much, but you know, they can extend well away from the center, hundreds of miles. So even if the storm and the, the worst conditions are well away from the area, you still get these rain band um, tornadoes that can come through. So they can hamper, you know, preparedness activities and things like that. So it's definitely something that, you know, you have to keep in mind, be alert for any tornado warnings that we might issue uh, as well. So good question. Okay, and then we'll do one more question um, and then we'll wrap it up. And I know Bob mentioned this, but as a reminder, when you guys close out of your webinar, there will be a feedback screen that comes up, just a quick survey. So we'd love your feedback um, to know what was useful or um, if there was any improvements or um, anything like that. So please um, try to take that if you have time. Um, I also did want to mention somebody asked about the PowerPoint deck being available on the website. They'd like to share it. Um, so Bob, I'm sure we'll make it available. Um, in some form, um, whether it's on the website or we put that in the follow-up email. Okay, so the final question um, for tonight, um, we will, I'll take, 
is the frequency and or intensity of hurricanes increasing? Yeah, um, that that that's a big question. Um, you know that we often we often hear. Um, you know, as far as our local area, when we did our local study, um, the there are more storms um, in you know over the recent past com compared to um, you know. Again, our records, official records, go back to the mid 1800s. Um, we essentially found that there are more storms overall, um, but not necessarily the intensity increasing. But again, that's more of a local, you know, localized study. Um, I'm not as familiar with the overall. I mean, if you look at the big picture, um, you know, for the Atlantic Basin, of course, across the the globe, that's that's a different issue, and we're really not focused on that. Um, I'll speak on a, a couple of those, Bob. Um, so I will mention that this year, um, the recently updated the new normals. Um, so for the average Atlantic hurricane season, so we were using the 30 year normal set from 1981 to 2010, and we're now using the 1991 to 2020. And with that normal update, so that's how we can kind of tell if it's going to be an above or below normal season. And with that update, they did increase um, the number of named storms. So now the at average number of named storms based on that 30 year normal period, which includes the last 10 years is 14, whereas it was 12 um, in the 1981 to 2010. So there has been some um, adjustments in um, the overall um, Atlantic Basin. And then with regards to um, the intensity increasing, um, there has been more studies being done. Um, so our National Center for Environmental Information, they do a lot with the climate change and global warming, and there has been more research that is linking um, climate change to increasing intensity for hurricanes. So there's still a lot of research to be done, but certainly with the warmer waters, um, you know, that's, as Bob mentioned, one of the fueling factors, um, the ingredients needed to, for hurricanes to form. So um, there is more research being done, but there has been more links um, between climate change and increasing intensity of hurricanes. And it, again, it's not, uh, along with that, just a, an extra point is that um, more, you know, warmer water, obviously you can get more intense storms, not necessarily more storms, but the ones that do develop, you know, potentially could be stronger as far as wind speed and also have more moisture available. So that um, that means stronger winds could mean bigger surge. It can mean heavier rainfall as well. So. Yep. So we didn't unfortunately get to all the questions um, since it's a little getting a little late now. We will try to capture those questions and either send a follow up email with included PowerPoint and maybe some additional links. Um, so appreciate everyone for joining. And again, if you want to fill out that survey, that should automatically pop up once you launch out of your or exit out of your um, webinar window. Um, so, Bob, did you want to wrap it up? Say anything? Uh, that's it. I hope everyone has a great night and uh, safe hurricane season. And we'll be talking to you soon. Thanks, everyone.